Welcome to Whitehorn House Museum, a museum of Newport furniture, craft, and design. This is Furniture Inside Out, where we take a close look at one exceptional piece in the Whitehorn House Museum collection and explore how it was made, how it functioned and still functions, and even unpack some of the current mysteries surrounding the object from the inside out. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Green. I'm a furniture maker specializing in 18th century Newport furniture and a researcher in uh, the same subject. And we're here today with one of my favorite pieces of Newport furniture. Uh, this is the uh, dressing table at the Whitehorn House collection. So why is this my favorite piece of Newport furniture? Um, probably because it's quintessentially Newport. It's everything that Newport furniture should be. I describe Newport furniture as having uh, an austere, an austere elegance, and this piece really uh, displays that quite well. Um, like a lot of Newport furniture, uh, the ornament is very subdued. Uh, it's mostly the form of the piece that is appealing. So it's very handsomely proportioned with uh, slipper feet. And the only ornament is this uh, uh, carved shell in the front board. And that's it for ornament. There are a few things about this that are especially interesting. Um, we'll take a look at the uh, construction of this low boy and how it's different from uh, case pieces uh, like high boys or low boys that were made in other parts of New England. Uh, Newport furniture was very different and easily recognizable. And then we'll take a look at some of the details of the, of the shop that actually made it and we'll discuss a little bit um, who could have possibly been the craftsman who, uh, who made this, or I should say, whose shop made this, because shops were usually uh, a group of, in Newport, four, five, six craftspeople uh, working together. So it was sort of a joint effort, but we'll take a look at those details. Okay, now we've got this uh, low boy flipped over and we're looking at how the, um, the legs are joined to the case itself. Um, if you'll notice, the leg ends about Oh, about five inches into the case. That's the end of the leg. It's, it is actually glued into the inside corner of the case, and there are two glue blocks on either side that uh, strengthen that glue joint. So between the leg itself and the two glue blocks, there's a lot of surface area for glue. So this is a, a pretty stable way of constructing things. But this is the way uh, Newport furniture, both low boys and high boys, uh, were built where the case is um, uh, essentially a box and then the legs are added to it. There are a couple of things about this kind of construction that enable Newport furniture to be very highly refined. Uh, because the legs could be added later, uh, a shop could spend extra time working on the legs, carving knees, carving long claw feet before they needed to be joined to the case. So. Uh, this is one of these uh, parallel processes that went on in Newport cabinet making shops where uh, one craftsman would be building the case itself, another craftsman would be working on the legs, and then the two were joined when both of them were finished. So the construction on the front is identical to the construction on the back. If I can rotate this around. You can see we have uh, the front leg going into the case about five inches and glue blocks on either side securing it. One thing that's interesting about this low boy, and I should have mentioned before that this low boy is very similar to two other low boys in existence. There's one at the Met that was the, uh, the uh, gift of Tom and Yvette Cole, and there's another at um, Chipstone, and that has a bill of sale from 1746 from uh, Job Townsend Sr. to Samuel Ward. It mentions a similar low boy. And uh, all three of these low boys have uh, very similar uh, dimensions. And the uh, apron shape in the front and the apron shape on the side are virtually from the same pattern. So they're very closely related and probably by the same shop. Another very interesting detail about this low boy and the other pieces of furniture that are in this family are the, uh, the little knee blocks. This is a knee block that's added between the leg and the apron. And in all of these examples, the inside of that 
knee block is angled out just a little bit, about 20 degrees. Uh, it kind of follows the, the curve of the front. It's sort of at the same angle, but uh, it's not seen on other Newport furniture or things from other shops. It's a very small detail. I think I had probably, I had probably looked at this low boy 20 or 30 times in great detail and never noticed these, uh, these little angles on the block, but it is a piece that's characteristic of the shop. And uh, one piece that points to who the possible maker of this was. So now that we know how the legs were joined to this, if you look inside, you can actually see the, the end of the leg inside this drawer opening. And you can see the glue blocks as well that keep it in place. So how was the case itself built? The Newport version of building these cases in, in uh, high chests and in low boys was to dovetail them together. It's not visible, but underneath this strip, which is only about an eighth of an inch thick, are dovetails. The uh, front apron is dovetailed to the side. Uh, the drawer divider is dovetailed in to the side as well. And uh, so is the top rail. So this uh, eighth inch strip covers these dovetails. If you remove this, you would see probably three little dovetails here, one dovetail right there, and behind here, is a little block just to build up the uh, thickness of this eighth inch strip. Um, the dovetailing, the construction, is quite visible if we look at the back of this. And here you can see the back panel and the side panel are joined by one, two, three, four, five, five, maybe six uh, dovetails. So the case is essentially a box with legs added to it. Um, there are some great advantages to this. In other parts of New England where the leg was a corner post and everything was tenoned into it, um, you frequently see sides that are cracked, backs that are cracked, because the sides and backs can't expand and contract with changes in humidity. But um, with this kind of construction, the entire case can expand and contract a little bit and there's no cracking. So, although it started out as a um, kind of a Newport only form uh, and method of construction, it, uh, it really had practical purposes and has really led to the longevity of a number of Newport pieces. Uh, this shell is identical to the shell that's on the uh, uh, coal lobe at the map. Uh, it's an incised shell. It has a circular, uh, semi-circular cutout around it. Um, and then the lobes are, uh, you know, typical of Newport, uh, typical kind of depth. And we have a, uh, instead of a palmette in the center, this one has a, uh, an empty center. Uh, the interesting thing about this shell is that all the rays are curved, except for the, the very last one, which is at the, along the bottom edge of the case, which actually has a flat top to it. It's almost square. It's just a tiny little detail that differentiates the maker of the shell from uh, you know, the vast majority of Newport shells that were made. An interesting detail. Maybe original finish in here and the rest of it was cleaned off. But the, you know, the surface has been, has been stripped and it was refinished at some point where it was easy on the nice flat surfaces. But here in the shell where uh, it's quite a bit more difficult to get the finish off. We do have traces of um, perhaps not the original surface because those are rare and fragile, but certainly an early one. You can see alligator um, finish in here and quite a buildup of it and a really nice dark old patina that the rest of the piece doesn't have. But imagine the entire piece with this kind of surface on it. Again. Well, let's talk about the drawers on this piece, because this is probably the most, the drawers are probably the most interesting part of this low boy. And drawers, because they are detailed and labor intensive, can also be the most revealing of uh, any part of the anatomy of a piece of furniture. Um, you find a lot of um, the makers, uh, very specialized techniques going into drawers. So they're always quite revealing. Sometimes they're just like a signature. The Newport method of building drawers was to dovetail together the drawer sides and the drawer back, and then apply the drawer bottom to the bottom of the drawer side. So you see the end grain of the drawer bottom. This is 
has come to be called um, Newport Through Bottom Drawer Construction. Underneath that, a little runner has been added. And here, you can see the wear. You know, it's gone from about 3 eighths of an inch thick down to an eighth of an inch. So it's worn quite a bit. But this is just a little strip. It's only about 3 quarters of an inch wide, maybe an inch wide. And this is the runner that the drawer actually slides on. Um, nice thing about this is that when it wears, the way it has here, it can be replaced pretty easily. So there are some uh, advantages to the Newport style of construction. And if you see how this is built and where it slides into the case, inside the case there's a runner on the left and right. So those, um, those little strips on the bottom of the drawer ride right on those rails. In the um, smaller drawers in this dressing table, as in high chests, rather than having runners on either side, there's just one runner in the center that is, uh, it's led into the drawer front. In this case, the drawer is built in a similar manner. And then we have the drawer sides with an applied bottom, but we don't have the little strips on either side for them to run on. Uh, the drawer would actually slide on the drawer bottom. You can see the wear pattern from where it's been used. Um, not easily replaced, but it's not something that wears out a whole lot either. So, that's a Newport drawer construction in general, very typical of Newport. And in this case, we want to take a look at what the individual craftsman did when he was building drawers. Building drawers is, it's the perfect job to just have one person doing over in a corner of the shop. Um, there are lots and lots of drawer parts. They need to be marked, they need to be kept separate and someone's got to dovetail the ball and put them together without getting them mixed up. So it's a perfect little operation to kind of sub out to somebody in the shop who likes doing this detailed work. In this case, the um, cabinet maker who did this uh, used a square top on the drawer sides and back. Sometimes in Newport pieces you'll see a rounded top, which is a nice little finishing touch. In the case of this shop, um, the drawers are always made with a square top, it's just uh, sort of a labor-saving point. And the dovetailing itself is pretty basic and functional. On both the front and the back we have two dovetails. You know, not crazy with little multiple dovetails and tiny little points. Two fairly large, um, well-made very functional dovetails, both in the front and the back. And we see it both on this drawer and on the smaller drawer, exactly the same thing. Another interesting point in this is that the uh, drawer sides protrude a little bit beyond the drawer back. And that's the case in both of these drawers. They protrude just a little bit. <clears throat> Sometimes cabinet makers would plane this off, plane this extra wood off, just to give it a more finished look. And it was just not the uh, standard operating procedure in this shop. So we can see that they used a square top, um, typical Newport drawer construction, and just didn't get into the very fine finishing details <clears throat> of cleaning up the back and cleaning up the top of those dovetails. So this is, uh, you know, both of those things are things that are um, really signature points of the person who did the dovetailing on this. But there is no signature point that comes close to an actual chalk mark. And in this case, we have a mark that's on the back of this drawer. Um, no one knows quite what it is. Uh, I thought it was an S, a script S. Looks like that sometimes. Um, some people call it a D and the possible maker of this has been given the name Joiner D. I thought for a while that it was just really kind of a half moon. This is a, a, a mark that is on the back of the drawer, just noting that someone made it and finished it and probably that it's ready to go. In a chest of drawers, they might have four or five drawers, um, they all have the same mark on the back. Uh, the Townsend shop, Christopher Townsend and his son uh, John Townsend, would carefully letter the backs of their drawers, A, B, C, D, alphabetically, so that you knew where the drawer went and they knew what the parts were for. In this case, the drawer was put together and someone would just put this mark on it. 
Uh, the same mark has been seen on drawer dividers. And drawer dividers are similar in that once they're made and the piece is being put together, you need to know what the top and the front and the back, uh, how that's oriented for when the case is joined together. And I actually have the top half of a high chest made by the same maker and every one of these uh, drawer dividers has the same half moon on it. It's sort of used as a mark just to orient to, uh, you know, what's up or what's the front or what's the back. Um, when I build furniture, I tend to use X's. I'll put, a, I'll put an X in the corner and if I need to differentiate it from another drawer divider, I'll put in two X's. So this is just someone's uh, really just uh, shorthand in the work that they were doing. The other thing that's interesting about this is that there are more marks on here that, was, that, were, actually, that were actually not discovered for years um, very tiny little marks, and they have to do with how the drawer was put together and which drawer it was. Imagine that you're dovetailing drawers and uh, you've got perhaps something bigger than this, maybe a high chest that only have a dozen drawers. You've got, uh, you know, four drawer parts for every drawer. So you've got, you know, 48 or more drawer parts sitting on your bench. They have to be kept together and kept organized so you can keep them in a pile and mark them. And once they're dovetailed, uh, or once you start to dovetail it, you need to know what's the inside, what's the front, what's the back, really how these things are going to be, uh, how these pieces are going to be oriented and how they go together. So in this piece, after many years of looking at it, I found some very tiny chisel marks. So here you see two little chisel marks, but they're on the inside of the drawer. They don't go all the way across. It was done, it was, uh, done very deliberately. And across from it, are two more little chisel marks on the inside. And they're also repeated on the back, although it's harder to see in this drawer. So what this cabinet maker was doing was he was marking the parts so that with these little chisel marks on the inside, so you know that this piece should be oriented. So this is the top, this is in the back, and this is the inside. Same thing here. This is the top, this is the inside, and it's oriented towards the back. And with the chisel marks that are on the back, uh, again, it tells you what's the inside and what's the top and how it should be, how it should be um, oriented and assembled. In this case, we have one little chisel mark on all the parts in this drawer, which is the left-hand drawer, and we have two little chisel marks on all the components of this drawer, which was the right-hand drawer. So, in the case of drawers that were interchangeable, you know which is number one and which is number two. So, in the case of the full-width drawer, that is the top drawer, this is just marked with one chisel mark, so um, the cabinet maker knows how to put this together, but just the, just the size of the piece um, tells him, you know, lets you know it's not going to be interchanged with any other drawer. So these are just tiny little marks that were, that were uh, used to keep these parts um, organized as they were put together. If you look at furniture from the other side of the Townsend family, Job and Christopher, you will see a deliberate effort to market for customers, A, B, C, D, E, so they know where the, where the drawers are going. In this case, these marks were not for the customer at all. They would have to figure out where things were going to go, just based on the size of them. So this little detail, uh, the way of marking these drawers, um, where inter interchangeable drawers are marked one, two, three, four. Uh, in the case of a desk, there might be as many as six small little drawers and they all have the same little marks. Uh, these are all um, just really signature points of the cabinet maker. Based on what we know of this furniture and based on the fact that a very similar low boy has a bill of sale from Joe Townsend Jr., um, it's my 
belief that uh, whoever made this was in the employment of Joe Townsend Sr. Um, maybe not Joe Townsend Sr. himself, but someone in the shop. Joe had, uh, I think, six sons who went into the cabinet making business as well as a number of apprentices. So to say this is a product of the Joe Townsend shop seems probable. And the other thing is just based on, just based on the number of Joe Townsend pieces, he was a major maker, Joe Townsend and Christopher Townsend were the two brothers who founded the uh, uh, cabinet making dynasty in Newport. Uh, there are quite a few pieces that are identifiable to Christopher Townsend. Very few have been identifiable to Joe Townsend Sr. Suddenly we have these pieces that have this, this mark, the half moon, the D or the S, whatever it is, that all have this similarity. So it's a similarity in marking, a similarity in drawer construction, a similarity in um, um, just the uh, geometry of the drawer with the square tops that tie all these pieces together. And so it's very probable that these are all um, products of the uh, Joe Townsend Senior Shop. It's um, interesting also to see that some of these details were carried on by his son. The, the shop actually went on for three generations. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Furniture Inside Out, and we hope you will visit us at Whitehorn House Museum, either on site or from your own home at newportrestoration.org slash whitehornhouse. And if you would like to support the work we do, please visit newportrestoration.org slash support. Until next time, we hope we inspired you to take a closer look or a second look at your own furniture. Thank you.